Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this 13th panel in our series on decolonizing Europe. Uh, my name is Tasneem Anwar, and together with my colleague Beste Ishleyan and the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, I co-organize this series on decolonizing Europe. Um, so today I'm very happy and excited to be discussing a very important topic, uh, gender and sexuality, which is something that has come back in previous conversations during the, these webinar series. But we're very happy uh, to dedicate a full conversation to this topic to draw out some deeper questions uh, about entanglements of gender, sexuality, and colonialism. And we're very happy and honored that uh, our two distinguished speakers were able to join us today, uh, Professor Sara Braka and Dr. Sandeep Bakshi. Um, I will introduce the speakers, and then I'm really looking forward to um, commence the conversation with you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Sandeep Bakshi is a uh, researcher's transnational queer and decolonial uh, initiations of knowledges. He received his PhD from the School of English uh, at the University of Leicester, UK, and is currently employed as an associate professor of postcolonial and queer literatures and literary translations at the University of Paris. Um, he is also a co-editor of Decolonizing Sexualities, Transnational Perspective, Critical Interventions, uh, and Decolonial Trajectories, Special Issues of Interventions. And he has published on queer and race problematics in postcolonial literature and cultures. Um, and we are also joined by Professor Sarah Bracco, who is a professor of sociology of gender and sexuality at the University of Amsterdam. She is also the co-director of the Amsterdam Research Center of Gender and Sexuality, ArcGIS, since September 2019. Um, be before joining us at the UFA, she worked as a senior researcher at the Center of Expertise on Gender Diversity and Intersectionality at the Freie Universiteit Brussel. And currently she is the PI of the NWO funded BT grant Engendering Europe's Muslim Question. A warm welcome to your both. I'm really happy and excited to be here with you today. Um, so um, yeah, I just want to uh, kick off the discussion uh, with a more of an introductory question um, to get us started on this topic. Um, so recently, uh, or at Attention Academia and also among activists uh, on queer studies, gender studies have been present for a long time. But recently, these debates have become more prominent on the agenda, uh, giving more space to postcolonial feminist critiques, uh, indigenous voices, intersectional understandings of racism and sexism, homophobia, transphobia as axis of oppression. Um, so just by means of introduction, I would like to ask you whether you can tell us a little bit more about how you apply this lens in your research, in your teaching, and in your methodology. Um, Sandeep, may I invite you first to give us a bit of an introduction? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Tasneem. So thank you, Tasneem. Thank you, Beste. And thank you, Sarah, for being around. And thank you to the Amsterdam Center for European Studies um, to invite me. Um, this is really important because um, I think um, at the outset, if I may, by means of introduction, I'd like to comment upon how certain spaces that have been pried open have often been after a long struggle of decolonial and postcolonial feminists and activists um, who, despite what we may want to erase, have existing genealogies of critique. So I can think of, you know, queer of color critique that was kickstarted by Jose Minos's work in 1999, disidentifications. That paved the path for aberrations in black, uh, you know, the path for queer of color critique. Now, in this context, and in terms of my positionality, um, both as an academic of color researcher or simply as a human being, you know, um, it is of critical importance to acknowledge, um, and I'm pausing for effect to acknowledge both how, ben how I benefit from their work and how, for instance, I'm a beneficiary within systems of power of rampant anti-blackness in Europe and beyond, and specifically of caste patriarchy in, in, this, in South Asian contexts. Not just caste patriarchy, obviously Islamophobia in the Indian context, if I may. 
So as an acknowledgement, um, and I'm very well aware that acknowledgements can serve as empty performatives, um, of course, and may not serve to subvert the system. And it is, I don't think I can subvert the system. Um, I do think of acknowledgements um, as what just before says, as enabling nonetheless. Uh, they can provide the space um, as we have here today to reflect upon positions of privilege to those like myself who inhabit it and encourage the other of others to reflect upon how to take up that space that rightfully belongs to them. Spelling this out in my research and teaching has allowed me, for instance, to converse with different constituencies of students, colleagues, activists, such that newer conversations have emerged. Now, in terms of applying the optic of queer intersectional and or decolonial approaches in my work and teaching, I find it useful to signal the critique of coloniality of power, which is generally used as shorthand for coloniality within transnational approaches to genders and sexualities. Um, so if you would allow me to share my screen, I don't know if I can share my screen. Um, if you would allow me to, okay. Uh, you will have to, all right, that's all right. Um, so I call, I, um, it's, it's just about um, the network that I call coordinate, the Decolonizing Sexualities Network. Um, and we stress on colonialism, coloniality and decolonization in both global North and South. So in this context, as I began, there can be no romanticized, um, reading of the global south in terms of axis oppression that you were talking about Tasneem. Um, I think I can I can share my screen now it seems. So you see yeah, you should be if able you, to, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think you're, you're seeing it. So we talk about a transnational collector that brings together um, academic, academics, activists and artivists from across the global north and south for whom colonialism, coloniality and decolonization are the most important elements of an analysis. And that's all I wanted to show uh, because I wanted to stress on these three words that we, or concepts, if you like, that we work with. Um, so um, in terms of access of oppression, um, it is not just a critique of gay international, you see, but also refusing to advocate a redemptive reading of geolocations in the global south. Um, I'm particularly informed about the Indian occupation of Kashmir, for instance, uh, which suggests a continuity of coloniality that we all struggle against, you know, in post-colonial India today, for instance. For me, um, if queerness becomes the node of emancipation and justice, and more importantly, liberation of all peoples, then Kashmir is a queer issue, you see. So I, I think Sarah would probably want to come in there. Sarah? Thank, yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much, Tasneem, first of all, and Veste for organizing this and bringing us together. And thank you, uh, Sandeep, um, um, for everything you've already put out in the conversation. Um, I want to enter into this conversation, maybe also with for some a caveat or an introduction, um, that first of all, I, or at least from where I stand, and I will come back to positionality in a moment, to me, it seems that we're also not talking about one lens or one optic, right? Like I think we're talking about the multiple and maybe we can get more into that in, in the conversation as we go on. There are different epistemological traditions that I would consider to be decolonial or postcolonial. There's also, there's different linguistic traditions, right? I'm actually very happy that Sandeep is joining us here with, you know, one important positionality being positioned in France at this moment, right? Which in, in the Dutch um, discussions, I very often miss because of linguistic issues, you know, that there's some kind of like total separations of the discussions that happen uh, that are going on in, in France and going on in Amsterdam at the moment. So, you know, and that's only two small countries. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry for the French now that I said that. <laughs> two small, two countries in Western Europe, whereas, you know, so we're talking about the multiple, right? And, and, and how do we do that? How do we talk about the multiple in ways that make sense? And so that's one little caveat. And another one is about my own positionality and kind of my, I would say, modest, I hope, uh, entry into the question of decolonizing gender and, um, and sexuality 
because to be very upfront, I don't necessarily consider myself, it's not something I immediately identify with as I'm a decolonial scholar or a scholar of decoloniality. So that's not where I stand here. Um, and, but my entry into to this and also how I got to meet uh, Sandeep before, um, 10 years ago, <laughs> uh, before today, is um, from being involved as a feminist in feminist movements and uh, basically the headscarf debates in the feminist movements in Belgium where I was at the time and this was the time beginning of the 2000s, you know, post 9-11, beginning of the 2000s. Um, with uh, the discussions about the headscarf, about the ban going on in France. And I remember being part of that feminist movement, seeing the feminist uh, arguments being used also immediately after post 9-11, right? Uh, the bombing of Afghanistan to liberate Afghan women. So seeing all of that, being a feminist, being a white feminist, right? In a movement that in Belgium is, you know, absolutely not fully white, but, you know, largely white, or that there's a problem of white feminism in the feminist movement, let's put it like that. Um, it was not an option for me to remain silent, right? And so I remember around 2004, International Women's Day, and this was before social media, young people, <laughs> we wanted to do an international action under the title of not in our names, right? Like not in the names of feminism will we allow this Islamophobia, racism, bashing of Muslim women, taking away basic, basic rights of Muslim women to happen. So we wrote this op-ed, which we published simultaneously in France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. So this really was before social <laughs> media. And um, no, that was one entry. And of course, that was an entry that immediately, you know, um, was connected with my positionality and made me further think about my positionality, right? And there's always several options. There's always the option to say, well, I don't like what's happening here with feminism. I disengage, I disidentify, right? Like I'm not a feminist anymore, you know? And that was not what I did, right? And, and again, there's mul multiple multiplicities, different ways of doing this. I was like, no, I'm, I am a feminist and I will not let the feminism that I am attached to um, I, I, you know, I have to speak out now. I will not let it take that direction. And so that was kind of, you know, beginning of the 2000s. And then around 2007, 2008, something similar happened to another movement that I'm less uh, involved in than in feminist movement, but still remain attached to, and that's the LGBT movement in Belgium. And so it, for me, it was almost as if I saw a repetition. And, you know, in terms of scholarship, this is, of course, the time where Jasper Puar's book came out, homo nationalism and I was very impressed by uh, that scholarship and I was also very impressed by the scholarship by Jin Harita Warren, Gay Imperialism, which of course was collective scholarship, right? Um, Ezra Erdem was part of that as well and uh, Tamsila Taukir. So that those were the things that I was reading and again in Belgium I saw it happening in the LGBT movements and that was a moment again that I thought okay it's not an option to remain silent and I got involved in this um, pink camouflage film project, which was in conversations with uh, LGBT activists in Beirut, with Sara Abu Ghazal, and kind of Brussels Beirut um, uh, conversations. And then a third little thing that kind of was my modest entry into all of this was Sabah Mahmoud's Politics of Piety. That was a book that changed me as a scholar and, and Sabah as a person later on also. And so that was something for me and I know that, you know, it's not necessarily the book that comes up immediately if people, you know, do kind of the shortlist of what is the bibliography of what you have to read on decolonial studies, right? So also there, you know, the different traditions, but it's a kind of scholarship that I feel very close to of taking a concept, agency, and also emancipation behind it, right? But taking a concept that is pervasive in our social sciences, right? And in our feminist scholarship, and start unpacking it, start to really to trace what are the Western slash modern slash colonial um, premises of this concept. And what would it mean to do our social sciences, you know, with concepts that leave those premises behind. And so th that is kind of how I got, that is probably why you've invited me today, right? Because again, I don't, I don't, you know, announce myself as a decolonial scholar, but I want to end this and to come to my practices today um, with mentioning the projects that I'm currently the principal investigator of. So that's the 
Engendering Europe's Muslim Question, which really tries to trace how gender and sexuality are crucial in the way that Muslims are systematically uh, prob problematized um, in Europe. And in that project, I do a number of things that I try to do in my teaching and my, my research in general. First of all, the shifting of the analytical gaze, right? So it's a project that is not about Muslims in Europe. It's a project that is about those people, institutions, processes that problematize Muslims in Europe, which by the way, includes Muslims, right? There's Muslims part of the processes that problematize Muslims in Europe. So, but that kind of shifting of the gaze, which just a little anecdote, when I had to put out the um, advertisement for the PhD and, and postdoc jobs that were part of this project, you know, so there's like one or two lines on the projects, right? Emphasizing the problematization of Muslims. And then I put a little warning. I said, you know, like, you know, alert, this is not a project about Muslims in Europe. Half of the applications were projects about Muslims in Europe, right? And how integrated they are and this and that. And so even though I had spelled it out in the advertisement, and I know the advertisement, you know, people look for jobs, you know, it's not, people are desperate for jobs in this academic precarious situation. So, you know, I don't wanna take that as a standard, but still I spelled it out saying, it's not about Muslims in Europe. And yet half of the applications were, you know, a project on Muslims in Europe. So that shifting of the gaze, I think is very important, but also hard work. Like it's easy to slip into, oh, let's talk about Muslims in Europe. And so that's one principle that I try to pursue as much as possible. And another one is, um, making the connections between different forms of racialization and racism. So we use the Muslim question in the title of the project. Politically speaking, that is not uncontroversial. Like it's, I've heard all kinds of comments on earlier versions of the project. I know that in some countries in Europe, it would even be more controversial. I'm thinking of Germany in the first place, but also in France. And so it's not uncontroversial. Scholarly, the scholarship totally adds up to say why it makes sense to speak about the Muslim question, right? And I won't go into it here now, but just to say this kind of connecting of different forms of racialization, I think is crucial to what we need to do. And the resistance is huge. Thank you so much for these introductions. And you already touched upon a lot of important topics that will uh, come back, I think, throughout the conversation. And, but for now, I want to um, stay a bit with the European context that you um, briefly just uh, touched upon, Sarah. Um, and, to, and you already addressed it in your introduction, how you uh, work on how gender and sexuality becomes a tool for othering within Europe. Um, Sandeep, also your work has included reflections on uh, queer diasporic knowledges and how to elevate the knowledge of queers of color and migrant queers. But how can we talk about these intersections of race and gender and sexuality, uh, especially in Europe in its current right-wing climate? Um, how can we talk about topics such as homonationalism, white feminism? Both of you already mentioned these concepts, but how can we talk uh, about these issues in such a um, difficult political and changing climate? Uh, Sandeep, may I invite you first to, um, to share your thoughts? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was really very um, fascinating, the way you located what has become now the European question on Muslims, and particularly in Belgium, but not just in Belgium. I'm thinking of France, for instance, or even Britain. Uh, so I am, so I'm not, I'm not going to comment on that, but I'm going to start thinking about, um, you know, in the current right-wing climate, one notion that um, decolonial politics, or as, as it's called, decolonial practice, um, enables us to understand is the idea of critical reemergence. Um, so, how do we reemerge from whatever has happened before? So, I'm going to comment on that a little bit um, before uh, thinking about taking up space that rightly belongs to queers of color, for instance. So. I just want to veer the discussion or rather steer the question towards queer and trans of color communities in Europe uh, that as Sarah mentioned in terms of Muslims are not new to Europe, 
uh, they've always existed. It's just that um, the specifically, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with two countries where I have investments as Britain and France, uh, they've always existed um, and they've always been connected to Europe. Uh, so the queer and trans of color communities foregrounding the mobilization against racism and other forms of exclusion um, has been through, for instance, art. You know, one of art has always been very political and that's what I work uh, with. So I'm gonna comment on that today uh, by thinking about how what has been turned as the decolonial thesis or through sensing, through knowing, through seeing, through believing um, has emerged over the years. What I mean to say is that, you know, what has been conventionally regarded as cultural practice has often ended up in the terrain of non-knowledge. It is not knowledge. It's not something about, you know, it's just a practice, uh, something that obviously, as we understand today, enacts um, epistemic violence against knowledge producing formations from outside Europe that have somehow sneaked their way into Europe. Uh, so decolonial queer diasporic artistic frames place such forms of knowledge or such knowledges in the plural at the very center of art. You know, if you look at artists, they bring into focus, not just, you know, what, how art has been politicized, but also practices of knowledge that though erased in Euro-American contexts, expose an obstinate presence within diasporic cultures in Europe. Uh, something akin to a particular stance of not forgetting the damage of coloniality or colonialism. So when artists speak, for instance, and Sarah mentioned this um, at the very beginning, uh, ling different linguistic contexts. So I'm thinking, um, you know, when artists speak in a non-imperial language in Europe or perform through a visible recourse to elements of cultures of origin, you know, it could be sartorial, it could be culinary or decorative, you know, it could be either. It becomes like that erased writing, like that palimpsest, the visibility of erasure, you know, the erasure that is all too often enacted through colonial aporia, which in decolonial knowledge we now call the colonial wound, you know, so this is the idea of re-emerging from that, is to make the erasure visible. Um, so as an example, if I can give an example of where I am at the moment in France, I can think of the Moroccan French artist Tariq Lacrissi, um, who does not speak the language of his parents, the Moroccan Dirija, but only speaks French, but is always, always aligned to as speaking Moroccan Dirija, um, even though it is spoken at home in France, um, in his home in France, is reviled in the public sphere. So Tariq, in his art, retraining his hand to write his language, or this language rather than his language, and tongue to speak the language of home, renders this erasure very visible. It is the palimpsest of colonization, and we know that what, what it is. From here, in this idea of the visible erasure, my contention is, can we not draw a line to align Tariq's queerness of being visible as a queer person, voicing his queerness in a way that is defined as non-normative, such that both being queer and of migrant descent become his relation to the world, is enmeshed in his relation to the world. So in other words, for the queer of color artist, um, questions of public and private are perhaps inseparable. They're practically impossible from questions of politics of existence, um, what we call critical reemergence. So I think that's one way of looking at it. Of course, um, if such art, and we all know about that, if such art does not get funded, then this art itself is not visible. And in, in there, there is this this language, this 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 grant speak that all of us have acquired over the years uh, to to sneak our way through. And I think it's it's just for the last three or four centuries that's for how non-European or non-white um, you know elements have been sneaking their way through, and that makes it extremely queer as well for me uh, because it's something that is not supposed to be there. 
you see, um, in a heteropatriarchal system, um, queerness is not supposed to be there, it's, it's supposed to be invisible. Um, so I, I think both of them are aligned and, 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 and for, for, for Tariq's queerness being visible um, is also his state of migrant descent being visible. So, so I guess there are these intersections that perhaps we would want to, to explore. So I, I don't know what Sarah would probably want to come in there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I'm I'm always um, in awe when people like I'm such a sociologist. I'm such a social scientist, right? And I, I always forget about the arts, which you know, dear colleagues in the humanities have just pointed out to me a couple of weeks ago. And so I'm always, you know, thank you for reminding um, <laughs> this <laughs> this certain type of sociologists that put it like that of the of the arts Sandeep and um, because I had thought about the question of talking back not with the arts and you are very right that that there's there's in a sense um it seems to me that there's uh, there's more to do there right like I mean there's more possibilities that's what I mean like that the in terms of thinking of talking back um which is already, already very constrained, right? Talking back in a sense already sets you up to, in, in this double bind with the discourse to which you talk back, right? And the art seems to be the field where probably there's more possibilities to break open those constraints. But I was thinking in a very constrained way <laughs> of talking back within the academy, right? You know, and that is constraint, right? That is institutional violence. That is, you know, which also again brings the the question of pos positionality there, right? Like, who who can still talk back in the face of that institutional violence, and for whom is that not an option anymore? So positionality is is, is again central here. But so I was thinking of talking back in the academy, talking back to theory, talking back to you know the institution, to the canon, and all of that. And it does strike me that we're in particularly mm, difficult times, in dire situations uh, for that, um, in at least this little part of the world, right? And it strikes me that we also need to perhaps see, and maybe I'm too optimistic or I want to be optimistic, um, that we are in these dire situations because things have changed. And I'm thinking on two levels, like I'm thinking of, you know, the level of knowledge and the institutionalization of knowledge, you know, however difficult, however painful, however violent and the symbolic violence, you know, we have managed, and this is a very vague and copious we, right? Like this is the we of gender studies, critical race studies, uh, queer studies, decolonial studies, you know, there's lots to say about that we, but for a moment I'm using that we, um, we have managed to, to, you know, to enter the academy. Because Sandeep, what you said before, you know, speaking specifically of um, uh, queer Muslims, but we can, you know, we can say that of, you know, of migrants, of people of color, of, you know, um, queerness in general has always been there, right? But it's about this entry in this constricted institution, which is the academy, but the entry has happened. So on the level of knowledge, the entry has happened, and that is one level. And then there's the level of, you know, what our colleague Nirmal Puar calls the somatic norm, right? Like the space invaders. Then there's the level of the bodies. So on the level of knowledge, it has happened. On the level of the bodies, a bit more difficult, but also it is happening. It has happened, you know, um, and it seems to me that the dire situation in which we are to speak back is also because and the knowledge and the space invaders are gaining some traction, right? So this is a backlash against things that we should also acknowledge and celebrate that they're there. Not to underestimate the backlash because the backlash is doing very nasty things. And I also feel like everything that we in this copious we have um, established can you know can be wiped off the table tomorrow like it feels very vulnerable but i also want to pause on you know what has changed because it also gives maybe less than in the case of arts but it also gives a horizon of none of this is written in stone right like we we can't we can change but then for me the challenge is then to really understand how these changes have happened like what connections do we need to make when, when do they happen? And when, because of, you know, 
the institution, but also because of our strategies, when do things fall apart? So really try to understand, consolidate what is there, be in solidarity when needed, be in support, be in community and understand how we manage to make these changes. And then there's a long road ahead to make more of those changes. Um, yeah, so I think that's that. Maybe I want to end on one little anecdote in this respect, because I do feel related to the dire situations, right? So I teach a class um, for 250 bachelor students, which is called Intersectionalities, uh, Colin, Class, Race, Gender and Sexuality. In six weeks, 250 students, a compulsory class, many of the students do not want to be in that class. So the fact that the class is there, you know, is part of the achievements. It's a new class. It hasn't been there for a long time. You know, some people, uh, you know, have questions about but what is it that they, you know, teach in this class or have to learn in this class, questions that in France are all over the media, right? Like what is, what brainstorming, brainwashing is happening in a class like that. So the class is there. Um, and one of the strategies that I went to was to actually, and this goes against my feminist heart and against my situated knowledge's heart, was, and this is gonna sound really weird, try to keep politics out of the class. By which I mean, I get, I try to keep opinions out of the class. Because we have like 250 students who, you know, but I think this about this and I think this about this and who speaks up and who doesn't speak up. And so really this kind of point of departure saying, we're studying here, we are studying race, we're studying gender, we're studying sexuality, we're studying class. There's by now a body of literature out there which is established by now some of this is part of the canon and you don't get to question that with your opinion in a way that if we think back, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, or, earlier with a, a, a white male ca canon, nobody would get it into their mind and say, oh, I haven't read any of this, but I'm not so sure if Einstein is right, right? I mean, I'm just making up <laughs> hyperbolic examples, but, you know, so I am demanding the same kind of respect and the same kind of scholarly attitude of those 250 students that I know, because I was trained by only by white male professors, that I know from my time at a Catholic, conservative Catholic university in Leuven, I want that scholarly attitude for the text of, you know, Patricia Hill Collins and Jose Munoz, you know, and not like, oh, but I feel or my opinion. That's one of the things that I try to, in a classroom, install to have, to be able to talk about these things, because if we're on the level of opinion, it's, it, yeah, we, we can't talk about what we need to talk about. Thank you. Uh, yes, again, thank you so much. And I'm when when I for, you know when I formulated this topic, I really wanted to pay attention to the dire situation, and also maybe because some a person gets tired just by watching the news and feeling their own bodies becoming part of this problem. Like Sarah, you talked about you know the whole discussion about the headscarf, the hijab being a visibly Muslim for me. Uh, it raises all kinds of questions about race, suspicion, gender, sexuality. And so I was kind of, um, let's say, wanting to address this uh, negative um, connotation that I have with the current time. Uh, I have to say that both of you really gave a very hopeful answer, you know, <laughs> either through art or through what we already have established in the academia. So I'm really grateful to, you know, also have these kind of positive um, yeah, confirmation of what has already happened. And thank you also, Sandeep, for pointing out that, you know, it's it's a continuation um, and that it's also something that, you know, can be made more visible and it's not something new. It's something that's already, ha always has been there. Um, and, and from that point, I want to maybe draw the, the conversation into also a, a transnational perspective and to talk a little bit about more the global afterlives of colonialism uh, in relation to gender and sexuality. Um, and I think both of you also in your in your scholarly work and in, in um, reflected on how there is a epistemic he hegemony of Eurocentrism when talking about gender and sexuality, but also very practically in terms of funding, uh, for example, funding uh, NGOs working on queer rights or empowerment. Um, and that there is a, also a, a power relation between, between the global north and the global south in this aspect. 
Um, and, and simultaneously, this also affects how certain, for example, authoritarian regimes, you know, use this as a tool to oppress queer activists, claiming that it's a Western or important idea or propaganda. Um, so how does colonialism, global forms after lives of colonialism play into this trope and how can decolonizing queer studies provide alternatives and solidarity and maybe transnational networks uh, that can support each other? Um, Sarah, may I invite you this time to kick us off? Yeah. Um, yes, that's... Um, I find it a difficult question um, somehow because well, for me, it's clear that whatever we need to do is our, our analysis and our strategies need to be multiple. I want to come back to that, that you know, multiplicity that we can't do without, right? Um, and I'm just, for instance, also what you mentioned, Tasneem, about, you know, global north, global south. And I'm, I'm thinking, and again, I'm taking it back to the academy. And I know you mentioned NGOs in, in your question, but I'm thinking, for instance, very concretely, because it's something that in my current institution we have lots of discussions about i'm thinking for instance on the conceptualization of race the notion of race right as a concept so the discussions again are very very multiple right like we are still having the discussions and i know that that is the case in france as well can we use this word right in the netherlands th that is still part of the discussion and that discussion we still need to do that discussion right like it's not yeah, it's not ended yet we're not beyond that yet so yes we still have to explain why it is important and so forth in the critique of the people who say, you know, but this is Europe, we don't talk about race here, we talk about ethnicity. Often it is said race is a US import, right? And I think that's the same in France as well, Sandeep, right? Okay, so when the critique comes from that side, we need to oppose that, right? At the same time, and so and I'm gonna do at the same time, a couple of times, at the same time, many of our conceptualizations of race are you know, formulated in US Academy because of, you know, imperialism, right? Like global imperialism and how that works out in the Academy, which works out in language and in publishing houses and so forth. So at the same time, that is the case. And among our students, for instance, we, we, we have students from um, different places in, in, in the African continent, right? Who also struggle with that notion of race. Right. And there, then there's like a global north, global south, you know, conversations on race going on in, you know, Amsterdam University, the Netherlands, you know, one of the, the, the prime colonial players in Western Europe. So it's all of this at the same time. So we, you know, yes, we have to make the argument to use why we need to use race. Yes, there there is a U.S. Um, uh, how to say, uh, dominance going on, and we need other conceptualizations as well that are more tied to, you know, other locations in the world. Yes, we need to think about the traps of essentializing race, right, which is another critique that is, so it's all of those things at the same time. And I do think it's difficult to do everything at the same time. And I actually also think it's valid to focus on one or two things, right? Maybe that's not very queer now, Sandeep, you're going to, <laughs> because sometimes, you know, it's human limits. We can't always do everything at the same time, but we need to connect all of those dots and not settle for only one of these arguments. And I'm just gonna end with reminding us of the title of the book by Gloria Wecker, Nancy Jaue, and Michael Botman. That was the first book that, uh, translated intersectionality in Dutch. The title was Kaleidoscopische Visies. So what, what is the English word? Ka kale kaleidoscope? Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Kaleidoscope. kaleidoscope. Yeah, ka Kaleidoscopian visions. And so there's something about that kaleidoscope, right? Like it is all of those things at the same time that I think we just need to keep on doing and bringing to whatever concrete subject or uh, struggle. Thank you so much. Sandeep, before I turn to you, just want to remind our audience that if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box uh, so we can uh, use them for continuing our discussion. Apologies, Sandeep, please continue. Yeah, that's all right. That's right. That's, it's, 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 it's absolutely, um, it's, it's great that you open the discussion on race, Sarah, and I'll come, come to queerness uh, a little later with the specific question of, of, of funding and NGO support that, uh, that Tasneem um, asked. So <clears throat> in terms of race, Gobino is French. So we know that race, um, you know, um, race science uh, 
came from France and perhaps it was imported or whatever. And I'm not very interested in, you know, import of ideas or export of ideas because we've always done that. I mean, ever since pre-colonial times, there has been trade, there has been import of ideas. And, you know, people knew each other even before social media. So it's not something that I'm very interested in. What I'm interested in is how, for instance, um, we refused, particularly in France, to see a genealogy of scholars who've written on race. Not just Gobineau, and I'm not thinking of Gobineau because he has been discredited, but I'm thinking of, you know, an appropriation of funnel, of France funnel. The book is literally titled Black Skins, White Masks uh, by post-colonial scholars has been quite an embarrassment that it has totally um, erased that Fano was engaging with race as a social con um, as a social construct. His whole idea of sociogenesis was about race. I mean, the book contains race in its title, Black Skins and White Masks. So I'm, I'm just thinking of how we want to, and I think I began this, um, you know, the first question I said, we want to forget certain things. So we want to erase certain genealogies, but it, it, it's still obstinate. Fano is an obstinate presence, uh, even today, everywhere in the world. And of course, if Fano is imported from, from the US, then so be it. <laughs> even though he is French. I mean, it's, it's just such a ridiculous and absurd situation that we are in today, where um, even those, uh, as you know, what's happening in France, you know, you, you were talking about the onslaught and the dire, dire situation, even those talking about post-colonial and decolonial studies are not citing funnel. They're, they are making it out to be Said Baba, Spivak and Mignolo and the rest, and you know, all the decolonial people, they're making it out to be about them. Whereas, you know, Baba wrote um, his book with Fano in mind, even though, as I said, you know, he might have erased or appropriated it in a very different way. So that's something that I have been thinking about in terms of race. The second question that you had actually asked about LGBTQ rights and, you know, um, human rights. So let's, let's, let's get on with it. So this is the raise the thin edge that we all work on. And we are very aware and in, in the decolonizing sexualities network that our network is a transnational network. There's a word transnational um, in our network. There's the word transnational in our anthology. So what we understand is that human rights, um, as Pivak would probably put it, is, um, are, are, are not something that we cannot not want. You know, it is there for everyone. It's not because, um, you know, uh, the West is saying that human rights are important that we'll say they are not important. However, for us, decolonizing queerness would imply that human rights frames are often weaponized, you know, as we've seen with several wars now, you know, in the contemporary era, it began with the Iraq war even, even before. So what we need to consider is that reflective of the disparate, you know, spatial, temporal positions, discourses of liberation from colonial empires produced differing narratives of power, you know, when, when people, and so this included, of course, a, in the case of, let's say, South Asia, in, in egalitarian hierarchies of geopolitical domination. So in this context, you know, the NGOization of gay rights or queer rights, as, is, as it has been called, has made it difficult to produce a critical epistemy that might be different from what, Kasnim, you mentioned as epistemic hegemony, you see. So any transnational network, we are very aware on queer politics, um, would need to grapple with the current power imbalance before wanting to say, uh, save black, brown, and other non-white queer lives from black, brown, and other non-white heteropatriarchal domination, you see? So what is important is the amplifying of grassroots um, local queer movements, trans groups, that either A, ask for help, or would consider a global movement which brings to light their struggle, you see? So um, I would just give an example before, uh, b b before, uh, b before, um, passing the mic on to you, Tasneem, is the case of David Cato, uh, the Ugandan queer rights activist who was murdered by the Ugandan state. It was an institutional murder. It's, an, it's just a very fresh reminder of wanting to impose our epistemological and activist comprehension of queer mobilization in the global North to its others. You see, working behind, standing with and behind, rather than working on queerness in the global South or the others can forge very different coalitions they're not mutually beneficial, they're mutually energizing. So I think 
we we need to 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 go past this thin line and say yes coalitions are possible but it's the terms of the coalition that has to change you see um it's it's not that the conversation is not happening the conversation is happening but it's a conversation itself not just the terms that has to change um so unless that happens we have seen with what's happening largely in kenya at the moment and i don't want to comment on that because the more it comes to light the more governments see that as western uh, or you know european american intervention so so somewhere we have to be very careful in um safety for 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 the safety of activists like kato who was murdered that we also need to listen to what people are telling us um not come with a, an agenda there is no queer agenda we know that but not come with a, a a set position of you know we want to save people uh that's not going to work because i don't know if anyone's ever told the saviors that you cannot liberate someone if the person doesn't want to be liberated i mean this is just a basic um you know in france everyone is a psychoanalyst this is just basic psychoanalysis <laughs> sorry <laughs> Thank you so much. Um I hope you both will forgive me for skipping over the final question because we have a few really good questions from the audience and I would like to give them the opportunity to yeah to to discuss them. Um so we have a um we have a question in the chat um um from uh Schuler who says I'd love to hear more about your thoughts about the concept of the somatic norm. the colonial wound and their relations to queering and decolonizing work more broadly from my experience teaching in the US the classroom has become an extremely politicized environment as well and educators are facing challenge of managing many emotions for me i've been thinking a lot about the use of therapeutic practice as a pedagogy however this is a lot of labor that falls unevenly on queer feminist subjects this is also something that we discussed previously in the webinar how it's a it's a burden really that falls on people who are already marginalized in academia um but i i'm also really curious about your thoughts um so sandeep can i invite you to uh, maybe reflect uh, shortly on it yeah hi hi shula um thank you so much for a very important question um I've had a similar experience to I've had a similar experience to Sarah where I've um taught a particular class on queer of color critique and another class on the on decolonization and in narratives of slavery where we've discussed statues we've discussed different things unlike Sarah uh my students uh came to the class because they'd chosen to come to the class so it wasn't um imposed on them because um it, that's the way it was in the university system you see the credit system and now all that things that we have here so i i was very very astonished to see that there are queer people of color in my university which is the biggest university in france with 60000 students and i don't see so many people of color and i don't see so many queer people and i was just very delighted to see that there are so many people of color in my class especially black women in my class interested in after lives of slavery and decolonization um and i'm very interested in the idea of using emotions why are we scared to use emotions in class it is a very political but there is no non political topic that we discuss ever in any discipline we know that um i totally agree with you that it can be emotionally draining for the researcher academic educator who is but if the class um is asking for that emotion i wouldn't shy away from it which included tears which included um shouting at another person because the person was trying to tone police uh the girl who was talking um as long as it doesn't become um a um, hand wringing match of you know uh you did this to us or you did this to our ancestors i wouldn't shy away from emotions but is isn't that part of uh, part of our experience as educators uh where we probably um go away and and cry for a bit just because things didn't work out and why are we so scared to cry in front of our students for instance i i i'm i'm not i'm not 
Um, and neither am I. And I teach my students not to be not to shy away from their emotions because this is a passionate class that they are dealing with for the first time with the colonial wound. And they were able to tell me, um, you know, we don't need um, decolonial theory to tell us that this is the colonial wound. They were able to tell me without reading decolonial theorists that there was something inside that they wanted to get out. And I said, what is it when you're doing this class on slavery, which is like 19th century or early 20th century? And they said, this is the mark of our inferiority. And it was said in these in so many words. And she was making that mark of inferiority visible and probably cathartic, probably, I don't know, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't want to analyze too much what she was trying to do, but it was articulated as such. And I can, of course, reinterpret it as a, um, the, the making the, the, the colonial wound visible or whatever we want to say it. But I guess in practice, when we are in front of our students and they are, um, even, even though you, you're teaching, I was teaching a class in Leicester on Jane Eyre and I had all white students with one black girl who was sitting there. And every time the discussion went on to race, everyone looked at her when we had to talk about Bertha Mason um, in the Caribbean. And as we all know, Bertha Mason is not actually black. <laughs> and, and so every time the question, the, the question came towards Bertha Mason, everyone would look at her. And the only answer the, the student gave was, <laughs> And that was it. I knew from there that it was exhaustion, that she doesn't want to talk about race. Um, it's not, it doesn't befall on her to talk about, to have this conversation on race. So I think I am all for um, harnessing emotions or exposing emotions. It can be challenging, uh, but that's, that's just a way of looking at it. But at the same time, it can be therapeutic for many students. Uh, to think about through literary texts or through toppling of statues or what it means to topple the statues. Um, there are, we, we are having this discussion about Winston Churchill uh, or we are not having this discussion about uh, the racial aspect of Winston Churchill in, in, in Britain at the moment. So what does it mean for a lot of people of Bengali descent to think of the famine uh, that came in the 1940s in, in the Bengal region of India? So I, I, I think these are questions that everyone needs to ask, not just people of Bengali descent, but all of us as educators as well. And I totally agree with you, Shula, that e therapeutic practice can be used. I don't know how to use it because I've never um, worked uh, with therapeutic practice, but I know when the discussion gets really very hot, it, it's a heated argument. That is where I try and come in. Otherwise I don't uh, because students also need to have this discussion among themselves without the educator being around. So, yeah. Sorry, that was long. Thank, no, it doesn't matter, Snip. It was really insightful. I think it's beautiful how you make space for emotions. And uh, maybe because we can stay on the topic, um, and Sarah, because you previously um, really centered also the experience of being in academia, I have an interesting question from uh, Chris, um, who says, as a queer researcher and student of research master in international development studies, I've been trying to find ways to shape a decolonial native queer journey for myself. Um, I will move on to the questions. And the question is, um, how should uh, current students, bachelor, master, research master, and future researchers, academics, deal with the academia, the academic machine, um, and the prerequisites that academia has set in order to be considered worthy enough to be in the academia? And I think it touches upon some of the things that you mentioned before. So I'd like to invite you to maybe take up this question a bit further. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. And I think that probably my answer, um, I might also be commenting on some of the things that you said, Sandeep. Thank you for that as well. Um, I think that the bottom line, or at least this is at universities that I know, is that the bottom line is that the university is not a safe space, right? And I'm tapping into, you know, the safe space discussions. And I know some students, you know, would like the classroom to be a safe space. And for instance, in that classroom with the 250 students that I refer to, I start by saying that this classroom is not a safe space. And maybe that connects also to the question, uh, Schuler, that, that you asked, um, be, why is it not a safe space? I think there's several reasons, but one of the reasons is in this neoliberal university, I am not giving the resources to make this a safe space. 
in, in a classroom, you know, six weeks, two hours per week of 250 students. And, you know, we have to do the whole, you know, get the credits. I do not have the resources to make this a safe space. So I am not going to pretend it's a safe space or take that on my shoulders. And, and you know, going back to that question of, uh, the, the politicized classroom and, and how much you can do. I think the answer is always context, context, context. And I loved your description of your class, Sandeep. I want to take your class, Sandeep. <laughs> um, but I also know that is something that you can do with a smaller group and with an elective. I also I, I know that in the large, you know, compulsory classes, you have to shift strategy. And then maybe in yet another type of class, you have to shift strategy. So I think it it for me at least it's almost a relief to acknowledge that it's not a safe space actually it's a space with a lot of institutional violence and so now coming really to your question um how to navigate a space with institutional violence and of course academia is not the only one right i think we, we you know we, we we go through various spaces of institutional violence and there the we is totally differentiated like it's you know positionality matters a lot only already the violence that you can see right um so many people don't see the institutional violence of the academy and you know depending on your positionality there's more violence that you see there's more violence that you feel um what do we do in the face of institutional violence i think community is always a good thing right try to find other people um you know with whom who see the violence right it doesn't even mean you know that have to be in the same position as you because for some positionalities that is extremely difficult in these european uh, academies to find people in precisely the same position as you but at least already people who can see the violence who are willing to speak up um and there again difference in positionality matters like I, sometimes it really makes sense to, you know, that for instance, a white person is the one who speaks up, right? Even though, and not wanting to appropriate, you know, um, uh, the critique, but, but, you know, being the face where you know that the institution might um, slap back, you know, so find community, understand the different positionalities within the community and think of strategies to keep ourselves safe because, the institution itself, you know, I don't, I can't direct some of my students to the safe spaces in the institution because I start by telling them they're not there. They're not there for students, they're not there for faculty as well. And I just want to, you know, bring this example again. A couple of years ago, University of Amsterdam students, by the way, students invited Jordan Peterson, right? Um, you know, which, you know, well, talking about gender, trans, and, you know, all of that, um, some faculty spoke out saying, you know, this is, you know, not, uh, this is a bad idea for a number of reasons, this dehumanizes part of our community and so forth. And the faculty who spoke out got death threats, possibly from within the student uh, communities, to be really honest, if I think about it, anonymous death threats university didn't even defend its faculty right the the a tweet went out saying uh, you know this the death threats are you know we condemn the death threats however or but you know like in one sentence in in the what is it 140 words of a tweet but we believe in free speech right so um neoliberal university the weaponization of free speech uh, makes uh, for the fact that we're moving in unsafe spaces for many of us unsafer for, for some more unsafe than for others. And we need to move collect collectively. It's almost that cartoon. Do people know that cartoon of like all the little fishes in the sea and then there's this big predator fish in, in one image of the cartoon and then in the next image it's flipped and all the little fishes make one the form of one big fish and the predator fish has to run away. I mean, that's a simplistic image, but I do think it's community that is the answer. Sandeep, please go ahead. Yep, yep, sorry. Um, so I was just saying, I was just thinking about what Sarah was saying, and I'm trying to connect to Shula's question uh, that I can see in the chat box as well. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, the, the institution or university or even outside is not the safe space. And I, I, I guess um, this whole, even when we are within queer people of color, it is not a safe space. I mean, this has to be our, um, because everyone's experience is different. 
um, of what a safe space should be. And I think it's uh, Sarah's caveat of telling everyone that uh, of the particular students that the, 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 the university is not a safe space um, is a particularly opposite one. Um, however, I would also like to think about the university as a space for everyone. And I think this is what the students need to know as well, that the university belongs to them as much as, I mean, it's not a private domain. It's, it doesn't belong to, um, to the state um, or whatever. It has been funded by the states in France and otherwise by private funds, but it belongs to everyone and everyone has a stake in it. And we can only change it, as Sarah was saying, through collective um, you know, mobilization. Now, coming back to uh, the faculty of color and especially the gendered faculty of color, as Schuler is, um, is suggesting, um, at the hands of colonial patriarchy. Um, I, I, I think the first thing that, that the gendered faculty of color has to think about, or the queer faculty of color has to think about is safety, um, is about how much can you actually uh, deal with. And there is always this idea of being invalidated by, student, by the student community. It, it is for it is true for cis women. It is also true for me as a queer man of color, uh, which is that if ever I make one single mistake, I know that um, you know uh, from the student community. I'm not thinking about the, from what's going to happen with within um, the university, but from the student community, I will be totally discredited. I know that, um, and in, and I think we just have to navigate it somehow because you can feel this at times. And to be fairly honest, Shula uh, Marquez, the thing is that there are only so many battles you can fight. And so we have to pick our battles with care. Uh, you cannot always, uh, you cannot always oppose a particular form, sinister form that the system might be imposing on you. It could be, you know, the students discrediting you. Uh, it could be your colleagues uh, thinking that you are not competent enough, uh, but sometimes it makes sense to just say, okay, fine, this is just pure jealousy. And, you know, not have that imposter syndrome because you're qualified enough to be there. I mean, the university belongs to you as well. Uh, and you cannot give them the comfort of your silence, but doesn't mean that you take on all the battles. It's not for you, as you yourself pointed out at the beginning, that, it, that that's a lot of labor, emotional labor as well. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think that's a, a beautiful note to end on that the university belongs to all of us. Um, yeah, and I, I, this is also, I think in many ways, this is the reason why Best and I started this series because this is something that we wanted to make visible that the university belongs to all of us. Um, so I think it's a, it's a beautiful uh, way to sum up um, some of the discussions that we had in this event. I really, from the bottom of my heart, want to thank you for your, um, yeah, for your reflections, from your honest contributions. Um, it was such a nice conversation. I feel really on a personal level energized in a way uh, that I didn't feel in this, this morning. <laughs> so I just want to thank you for that. Um, also thank the audience for their insightful questions. I'm sorry that we didn't have time to go into all of them. Um, but hopefully we can take some of them up for future events. Um, also want to uh, point to the audience that we have an upcoming session on decolonizing Eastern Europe, which is part of a smaller series of uh, decolonizing Eastern Europe. So please keep an eye on our website uh, for the upcoming event. Um, and also want to give um, as, uh, just a special attention to the Decolonizing Sexualities Network, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary, as Sandeep also said. So you can also check out their social media to see what kind of events they have coming up in their anniversary. Um, and again, just want to, to thank everyone for uh, contributing to this amazing conversation uh, and wishing you a wonderful evening. And for the Dutch people among us, don't forget to vote. Thank you.